Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I would like to thank Tokyo College. Uh, I am her tr her truly her the grateful for the four for being invited uh, to this. And uh, today, what I would like to talk about, France and Europe and Japan, who will be compared in view of uh, the Russo-Ukrainian uh, war. France, in order uh, to maintain uh, security, uh, different from uh, Japan, uh, do uh, have expedition uh, of uh, its military. By sending its military uh, up until 2012, from 2004, about 4,600 uh, uh, the military, uh, the, the members that have been sent uh, to Burkina Faso, uh, Niger, as well as uh, the Chad. And uh, they have uh, they been instructing uh, the, uh, the war, of course, which ended in her failure. But putting that aside, from 2014 onwards, in uh, Iraq, in order to support the government, uh, there is an international or the, uh, the mission uh, the being uh, planned, and about 600 uh, uh, the military troops have been uh, sent from France. Now, in the Ukrainian war, in dispatching the personnel, there were no uh, plans uh, or consideration at all of sending military personnel. And looking at Japan, which uh, have been very different from France uh, in bringing solution uh, to the security situation in Europe, but Japan has not uh, been contrib contributing uh, that much. But uh, from the early days for the Ukrainian uh, the war, from early days, uh, the military equipment has been sent, and back in 20, 2014, when Russia has annexed Crimea, uh, Japan has not participated in the sanction regime, but this time around, uh, Japan has strongly had the being joining uh, the, uh, the sanction uh, regime. So looking at the France and Japan, these two countries, what is the background of policy making is what I would like uh, to make analysis, analysis into. Now, starting with France, first of all, I would like uh, to say a few words on the style of diplomacy of President Macron. In the world, uh, those countries with uh, a huge power, uh, I believe uh, France uh, does have uh, such a political crowd, and looked from economic point of view, it may not appear to be that strong, but uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, the economic uh, uh, the sanctuary, so to speak, uh, the France is quite strong in five different continents. Uh, France has a presence, has a certain types of territory. And looking at those people who are, are living in uh, France, the population of France is about half of Japan. Uh, but uh, uh, the number of uh, the foreigners are far greater as compared to uh, Japan. And French is spoken in many different countries. And when it comes to uh, the Security Council uh, of the United Nations, uh, France does have a permanent seat. So President Macron himself has a lot of confidence over uh, the persuasiveness of uh, uh, his statements and his actions. With Chancellor Merkel, at the time of uh, a COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the Franco-German collaboration was quite successful, and dialogue that has been kept. And uh, the uh, the president of uh, the European Central Bank right now is a French person, and that uh, is a positive aspect for France. And uh, the President Trump uh, has been invited 
and tried to seduce him over, but it was not successful. And vis-a-vis -vis Iran, just like Japan, they were making overtures, but it was not successful. So as for his own personality, there are certain characteristics that we had the need to watch carefully. Now, looking at the attitude of the government of France vis-à-vis -vis Ukraine, we could perhaps allude to his personality. And there seems to be some mistrust and distrust. Let's say the trade agreement was concluded between France and the USSR in the past. And what Macron thought was important this time was not to be too much pushing down uh, the Russia and uh, China uh, camp. And uh, uh, the recently, uh, he was not really that successful in making persuasions, but I'm sure he had his own uh, motive. Looking at how France has been responding uh, to the Ukrainian war, I have given the background. But what has actually happened? So let me try to delineate what has happened from 2017. Lithuania, uh, Estonia, and Latvia, the former uh, USSR, uh, the countries that have a lot of uh, a lot of fear uh, of uh, the Russia, and uh, uh, they have sent uh, the uh, battle group, and uh, France has also sent 300 or so military uh, personnel. And from 2013, trying to enhance the deterrence for Romania, there have been 500 military personnel being sent from France. So in the surrounding countries of Ukraine, in order to enhance and strengthen deterrence of NATO, so trying to revamp uh, the eastern flank of uh, NATO. And for Cesar, a cannon, six sets, and uh, in total, 18 sets of cannons were to be sent uh, from the end of June onwards. But it was too belated, was the criticism. And thinking about the sanction to be imposed on Russia, France was quite cautious. And from May onwards, the oil embargo that has been decided and France has been maintaining such sanction, but not that cautious as Germany. So there are a lot of criticism over what France has been doing. Polish representative to the European Parliament has been saying that France has not been providing uh, weapons to Ukraine. And up until April, only ambulances had been sent. And it was 26th of June. Uh, together uh, the, the, with uh, uh, Chancellor Scholz and the Prime Minister Draghi, uh, the leaders of uh, Germany uh, and Italy, uh, the Macron for the first time visited Kiev. So uh, he uh, was seen uh, to be totally different from the other leaders of uh, the Europe. And another criticism is that uh, the 
uh, former Secretary General Rasmussen of uh, the NATO from 2009 to 2014. Uh, he was the Secretary General of NATO. And uh, he has been comparing France uh, with the United Kingdom, UK, next to the United States, have overwhelmingly supporting Ukraine. Uh, but on the other hand, France is all doing almost nothing, uh, which was a very harsh criticism. And just like uh, Denmark, that is the level of support given by France, was his assessment. So if you compare with the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom was very forthcoming. On the other hand, even though France is a major country of uh, the European Union, it is uh, doing very little. President Macron does not have a lot of trust over bureaucrats for diplomats as compared to President Trump or uh, President Putin or uh, about Iran, uh, the Macron tends uh, to do everything on his own. Uh, so uh, the foreign ministry do not have a lot of confidence over President uh, the Macron. Uh, Mr. Vito uh, was uh, the head of uh, uh, the, uh, the military, uh, but uh, he was sacked uh, by President Macron. So because bureaucrats do not trust President Macron, that means that information may not have been sufficiently reaching the president. Now, there was a presidential election. There were also elections for the a parliament as well, and the President Macron was placed in a very difficult position. So he wanted perhaps to avoid any, any energy crisis uh, to happen. So for oil, he did not want uh, to have uh, uh, in, being included in the sanction regime. And the defense capability of France seems to be rather limited. For example, the Caesar, the cannon, uh, was sent. Uh, France owns about 76 cannons, and out of which 18 have been sent over to Ukraine. Perhaps it means a lot. And also dependency in terms of energy uh, was a hard question. So France, as different from Germany under Chancellor Merkel, was not that dependent on Russia, but in terms of import of natural gas, 20% comes from Russia. So for the European Union, the quota is about 48%, and Germany, it is 55%. Uh, it's being imported from Russia. So overall, for Europe, it is 48 percent. So if you think all of all of this, Fran France's dependence on Russia is lower as compared to Germany, but still. Uh, he had to decide to extend the operation of coal-fired power plants because gas has become scarce. Those were hard questions for him. Now, in response to Russia, because of war, for one month or so there were no military support, and for sanctions amongst the member states of the European Union, there has been a lot of coordination that are being made. But including weapons, 500 million euro, that have been sent four times, so 2 billion euro have been provided and contributed as support to Ukraine. There is another interesting point. You, if you look at relationship between European Union and Japan, 
according to the French Foreign Ministry, against the crisis, the relationship between the European Union and her Japan, the coordination was superb. Prime Minister Kishida, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, uh, chairperson uh, of uh, uh, the uh, European Council, uh, Madame von von der Leyen, uh, as well as uh, the meeting with uh, the European President as well, and with uh, Chancellor Schultz, that uh, have chosen Japan to be the first country in Asia for him uh, to uh, the visit. And for France, because of uh, the election, and uh, he had to work as uh, the chair of the European Union for six months, so he did not visit uh, Japan. Uh, but the relationship had become stronger nonetheless. And at the time of uh, election, uh, he had a telephone conversation as uh, at the leaders. On the 12th of uh, the May, at the summit meeting, from humanitarian and the physical, as well as the financial uh, and uh, uh, the some military support, would be continued to be provided. If you compare to Europe and Japan, looking at defense, policy, there could be some similar impacts being seen because of the Ukrainian war. For European Union, like Germany and Spain, we'll have, to, uh, we'll have decided to increase its defense budget, and Japan, likewise, will be increasing its defense budget. And Germany uh, has allowed, at the time of uh, the wartime, for the few months, a German stance vis-à-vis uh, -vis defense has changed uh, dramatically. So in terms of transport of military equipment, uh, Germany uh, has uh, made an unprecedented uh, decision. Allow Allowing uh, such transport uh, to uh, the be uh, the made through uh, the European uh, Union channel. And perhaps uh, this may be a restart uh, for the defense uh, policy of the European Union. Denmark in the past has not uh, participated. Uh, in the European uh, defense policy, but uh, now they have decided to join. In order uh, to have procurement of uh, uh, military equipment, uh, some uh, proposal uh, that has been made uh, to uh, exempt uh, the consumption uh, tax and uh, support to Ukraine uh, will now uh, be paid out from European uh, the budget. So these are some of the changes we have seen for the defense policy Europe uh, has made quite a few changes. But looking back into history, there are some views contrary to what I have just explained. Uh, the NATO's attraction has been enhanced. Uh, Sweden, uh, Finland um, have now joined the NATO. So this is how France or the European Union have responded. And let me now turn to Japan, how Japan has been responding. During the 2000s, uh, not the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, but uh, Prime Minister's Office uh, was uh, uh, the, the leading uh, uh, the international cooperation and security discussions. When, in the face of uh, international crisis, global crisis, uh, the Prime Minister's Office uh, came up with a special system 
to coordinate different policies and approaches. Now, Ministry of Foreign Affairs is back again, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is at the center. European Bureau at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs basically is responsible for uh, sanctions against Russia and uh, humanitarian and uh, evacuation uh, supports. European Bureau of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is now leading the initiative uh, in the case of humanitarian assistance and evacuation support. Uh, International Cooperation Bureau uh, is there and uh, for uh, the supply of uh, supply of uh, dif different supplies. The PKO headquarters of the cabinet office is also there. However, there is a task force within the Prime Minister's office, without the task, without a task force uh, at the Prime Minister's office uh, in the face of the Ukrainian crisis, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is on the center stage. The Security uh, Bureau um, Director General uh, Takeo Akiba and this position used to be served uh, by a, a person from the uh, National Police Agency, but uh, Mr. Akiba, who is originally from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, is now in the driver's seat when it comes to security pro policies of Japan. So uh, it's a quite it's quite a change uh, for 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 Japan, uh, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, after an absence of ten years, is uh, now at the center stage in leading the Japanese response again. Uh, for, uh, against uh, the Ukrainian Ukrainian crisis. I mean, the attitude of Japan has changed also. Uh, Japan decided to, to supply gas to Europe uh, back in February. I mean, EU is highly dependent on the Russian gas, and uh, Japan decided to offer supply gas to Europe uh, back in February. This was an interesting uh, turn. In the past, uh, Japan was reluctant in receiving uh, refugees uh, 20 every year, uh, maybe. Uh, Japan received uh, Syrian refu uh, refugees, less than 20 a year. But now, uh, 1,300 refugees uh, can have come to, to Japan from Ukraine. Of course, uh, this is uh, significantly smaller in terms of number uh, in comparison to how, mu how many refugees European countries are accepting. But uh, uh, it is a very new stance for Japan to, to receive more than 1,000 uh, refugees. And uh, emergency humanitarian assistance, $300 uh, million, and uh, humanitarian assistance, $600 million. And uh, defense uh, supplies to Ukraine, drone, helmets, and uh, tents and cameras, vests. And this is the first time that Japan is uh, supplying these goods and supplies. And this is, uh, for the first time, Japan is supplying and sending these uh, goods to a country which is in the midst of a war. At the same time, Cambodia to Cambodia and India, to these uh, Indian uh, Asian countries, uh, Japan has uh, made diplomatic efforts. Uh, for example, Prime Minister uh, Kishida has nudged uh, Cambodia and India uh, to join sanctions against Russia. Although this uh, was not necessarily a success, uh, this initiative by Prime Minister Kishida was not necessarily a success, uh, it was an interesting turn because uh, there was no leader uh, from Europe. Emergency measures and uh, defense measures are there. For example, a call from Russia or oil from of gas and uh, the phasing out of import from Russia uh, is what uh, it is uh, contemplating on. Uh, 
I mean, taking into consideration what uh, it has uh, done in the past, uh, during the 1990s, uh, there were wars in Europe. But in 1992, Bosnia war started, and in 1999, Kosovo war started. Basically, NATO was there to respond to these situations in Europe uh, in the 1990s. But then, back then, Japan was not uh, there to support. Back in 2001, uh, during the course of a war, election uh, monitoring uh, people six uh, were dispatched uh, from Japan to monitor uh, the election which took in Kosovo, which took place in Kosovo. And during the Crimea uh, invasion aggression back in 2014, uh, G7 did not in G, though, though, although G7 imposed sanctions against Russia, Japan did not join. So what has changed when it comes to Japanese security and uh, defense policies? I would argue that there are a number of factors there. First of all, one, I think this is a part of the Abe legacy, uh, active contribution to peace, and uh, Japan playing a role in international security. Uh, Japan wants to be a, a global player. And I think uh, this uh, legacy is now materializing. However, at the same time, uh, there has been a change from the era of uh, former Prime Minister Abe, uh, because uh, Prime Minister Abe, Iran, Arab, uh, Israel, Russia, he visited uh, many times. And uh, his uh, talk to China and other countries to build uh, stable relationships while uh, ascertaining the Japanese position and uh, preserving Japanese uh, national interest. Uh, with the start of the war in Ukraine, I believe uh, Japan is has now options, uh, improving relations, its relations with Russia and the return of the northern territories uh, Japan has given up. And this war in Ukraine has also led to a situation where the public in Japan are increasingly aware of the potential war in Asia. And if and when there were to be a war in Asia, if you want Europeans to come to help, then Japan has to be there to support Europe when Europe is in need. So let's, uh, let me start to, 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 to move towards the conclusion, to my conclusion. Interna impact of the war in Ukraine on international security from a global perspective, deterrence. I mean, the, the war in Ukraine led to a stronger recognition, growing recognition for the need of deterrence. And uh, we have seen progress in terms of coordination between allies with the aim of enhancing deterrence, both Japan and Europe have decided to increase the defense capabilities and defense budget, which in turn leads to a German, uh, in Germany, Spain, and Japan. Uh, there have been a debate to increase the uh, defense budget. And another important point is this. For nuclear weapons, Former Prime Minister Abe suggested nuclear sharing and the discussion on nuclear sharing has started in Japan and I believe this discussion debate on nuclear sharing in Japan will continue and from a broader perspective nuclear non from a perspective of non-proliferation
AUKUS, Australia, UK, United States, the AUKUS submarine contract. The proliferation risk had increased as a result of AUKUS. Nuclear weapon state for the first time. Nuclear for submarines uh, to enhance uh, nuclear capabilities, which uh, had been absent uh, prior to AUKUS. And now with uh, war in Ukraine, uh, there is a growing attractiveness of nuclear weapons. Russia has uh, hinted at the potential use of nuclear weapons. So look from the perspective of non-proliferation, uh, the situation is less than desirable. Looking around the world, uh, the, the world is uh, increasingly divided. Russia, Turkey, and the Western Europe, uh, the relations among them, how can this be improved? Turkey, in particular, in Europe, is an important partner. Europe needs a cooperation with Turkey, and uh, this, the same applies to Russia as well. John May Shima, uh, the University of Chicago professor, says, talks about uh, questions, uh, the European responsibility for the Ukra Europe, uh, Ukrainian crisis. Uh, NATO, have, NATO has expanded twice. However, the Western Europe uh, has uh, turned a blind eye to the concerns that have been that have been raised by Ukraine and Georgia. Apart from that, uh, what should be done now? The sanctions against Russia have been a blow to economic blow to our societies uh, instead of. Um, damaging uh, the Russian economy. And uh, let's face this, the sanctions have not uh, garnered the wide support around the world. When there was an emergency meeting of the UN at the beginning of the war, and there was a resolution which was adopted by the UN, UNSC couldn't do that, therefore, the General Assembly had to be convened for the resolution. Uh, it is good that the resolution was uh, adopted at uh, uh, 93 votes for, uh, 24 against, and uh, there were uh, 58. Um, did, which didn't vote. So there is a significant divide in the world because 58 nations abstained. So there is a heightened uncertainties and the world is at a the, at the crossroad. I should operate the stream. So the Russia-Ukraine war and the uh, German security and foreign policy, that would be the title of my presentation. There has been G7 Elmau or summit held very recently, and Prime Minister Kishida has participated in the summit. Uh, he is standing next to President Macron. So today, I would like to look at the German history from a longer a time span since I have been given this very good opportunity. Uh, I am indeed very grateful of, to be able to speak to all of you. The G7 has started back in 
And at the time, uh, uh, the, uh, the Minister of Finance, uh, Mr. Helmut Schmidt of Germany, that has been instrumental. And he was with the SDP. Uh, the second the chancellor of SDP, uh, the first uh, chancellor was Willy Hebrand, and uh, Schmidt has succeeded Brandt, and he was from Hamburg. So uh, he is quite comparable uh, to Olaf for short. He is right at the center. Uh, he is not that a tall a person when he was uh, in Japan recently, and he was standing and walking like next to Prime Minister Kishida, and there height was almost the same, and even for a German person, he is quite small, uh, but uh, he is quite strong and uh, the very smart, uh, and he seems to be rather frightening a uh, person. And he is also from uh, the Hamburg, and uh, he is also from the SPD, and within that SPD, and he is within that uh, tradition, uh, he uh, is strong uh, uh, to uh, deploy uh, his uh, foreign policy. So looking at the, uh, the post-war or diplomacy uh, in the uh, history and the process, how could he be positioned? So at the G7 Elmar summit and the NATO summit, uh, the AP4, the Asia-Pacific four countries uh, that have uh, participated uh, at the NATO summit uh, recently, including uh, Japan. So I hope uh, to try to reach uh, the conclusion at the end. So uh, this is uh, the overall uh, a trend in which I would like uh, to give you my explanation. Perhaps in the interest of time, I had the will had be giving just a very short rundown. I will be giving you some of the ballpark at the points, and I hope to have more details to be given during the question and answers, since we have a professor who would like to ask a harsh and a difficult questions later. I am looking forward to the Q&A session. Now, about the three decades ago, I have written my third book, uh, The uh, Remilitarization of uh, the Germany. Uh, Konrad Adenauer, he was the very first chancellor of uh, Germany. Professor uh, Otake has authored Adenauer and uh, Yoshida Shigeru. Uh, Yoshida Shigeru, as a prime minister, uh, has put forward uh, the uh, uh, Yoshida uh, doctrine and Yoshida line, uh, which uh, has loomed large in uh, the foreign policy making. And uh, likewise, uh, Adenauer uh, has also uh, come up with a project prototype of uh, the German diplomacy, which it continues to even today. And for Adenauer, the most important point is what I have translated as West uh, integration, West Bindung. West means West, and Bindung means connecting. So back in the 1930s, uh, in the 20s and 30s, for the German diplomacy, and even in the olden times, like uh, at the time of Bismarck, a country in the middle, it is very, very difficult. You have to look left and right, you are sandwiched between the great powers, and you have very harsh time trying to survive. And Adenauer uh, was the mayor of Cologne, and during the Nazi times, he had a very difficult life. And after the war, uh, he had had the longest uh, the, the term as uh, the chancellor. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, the Chancellor Kohl uh, has uh, uh, even become longer uh, than that. But uh, Adenauer has decided uh, that pendulum diplomacy, uh, the seesaw diplomacy, is no longer uh, uh, good, uh, that uh, we should have a more fixed stance. That was at the heart and bottom of his foreign policy. And the Germany was thought uh, to, uh, to be looking at uh, the, towards the east because of Laparo uh, treaty. 
what has happened、uh, to the Germany. It is、uh, a cliche. Perhaps, back in 1989 and 1990, looking at unification,、uh, diplomacy, if you let Germany alone, it may become neutral and it may go nuclear. And those were the concerns, like、uh, uh, being stated by uh, uh, Mr. James Baker. And、uh, I thought uh, that. Uh, 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 the, uh, Germany was still being thought as such. Back in the 1920s, there was the lateral、uh, Lihue Treaty. And after the Versailles a peace a treaty, it is one of the peace treaties which has not been held in high esteem. And Germany had had to succumb and there had been imposed a limitless war reparation. And its armament has been very severely restricted. So,、uh, uh, Germany it was uh, uh, in uh, a uh, the very insulting、uh, position. Uh, even though、uh, the German、uh, race has been a very proud、uh, race in us, and after、uh, the, uh, the Laparo the Treaty, uh, Germany uh, and uh, the Russia uh, the has uh, become uh, the very uh, close and in cooperation, and training has been uh, given uh, far uh, into uh, the Russia for uh, the, uh, the German Air Force. So, Laparo, even today, is often cited. As、uh, the trying uh, to uh, characterize、uh, what may be、uh, the nature of、uh, the German diplomacy. But, so, as a system, I don't know, I thought、uh, that West Germany uh, should uh, be attached to the, uh, the West. And、uh, in the center, uh, there was the rapprochement between France and Germany, and the other was、uh, the NATO. The U.S. was right at the center in trying to commit uh, to uh, the Europe. This is something taken for granted that the U.S. is there and present in Europe. For the neighboring countries, Their anxiety and alarm over Germany would be ameliorated. So, as、uh, an origin, the Adenauer policy was trying、uh, to attach itself、uh, to the West much more closely. And uh, uh, Chancellor Helmut Kohl has succeeded、uh, this uh, policy. So, Kohl,、uh, in many ways, I could say is a successor to Adenauer、uh, during the Ukraine、uh, the war. Or、oh, the NATO's expansion towards the east that has been talked about in 1980s,、uh, 1990s, uh, when、uh, the Cold War has ended and the USSR has collapsed, whether NATO as an existence is. May no longer be necessary was often argued, but uh, uh, the Germany uh, should uh, be built into NATO and try to expand that and make it bigger. And that is because Helmut Kohl has been the Chancellor, uh, the Foreign Minister at the time, and uh, uh, Hans Lietrich Friedrich Genscher of FDP. He had a different thought and different argument. But、uh, Helmut Kohl uh, has uh, succeeded uh, the concept of Konrad Adenauer. In 1989, the walls, the Berlin, Berlin walls, have fallen. And in just one month,、uh, the 10 point statement has been given by Chancellor Kohl. And the European Union should be right at the center in bringing solutions to the European problems that was mentioned, and that uh, uh, we should render our helping hand to the East, was also mentioned. And、uh, the relationship with Europe and relationship with the France、uh, were placed right at the center of、uh, Helmut Kohl's diplomacy. But then Russia and Germany had a very in depth history. I have been to the Germany many times and I have lived in Germany. A while, it was mainly in Berlin, so mostly to, towards the east, eastern part of Germany. Uh, the Roman Catholic uh, culture 
is quite strong in Lineland. And in the north, uh, the Prussia, uh, the Protestant, uh, the culture is uh, more prevalent. So there are very different characteristics if you look at the different regions of Germany. But why is that uh, they have such deep ties with Russia? It was very hard for me to understand. Right from the Middle Ages, uh, the Germany and the German people have moved uh, the eastward, and uh, the western part of Russia that has been developed by Germans in the past. Uh, the, uh, there has been a trade between the, the Hanseyan, the League, and the Russia. And Kathleen the Great, there are movies, and I'm sure you do have certain image. Uh, she was from Prussia originally. And uh, just a few days ago, when I was trying to prepare uh, for uh, this uh, lecture, how many German brides have been wedded uh, to uh, the emperors uh, were five? that I have counted. So many have come from Germany and married into uh, the Russian or uh, the imperial family. Uh, the Russian uh, emperors were not able to have uh, Catholic brides, but then Protestant uh, German uh, the brides uh, have uh, adopted uh, the Russian Orthodoxy and they had a lot of money uh, as endowment, uh, as a, a dowry, so to speak. Uh, for example, Queen Victoria uh, is also a relative and uh, she would persuade uh, those German princesses uh, to marry into uh, the Russian imperial family. It is quite strange, but uh, towards uh, the left is uh, the Catherine the Great, and uh, the, uh, at the center is another bride, and uh, towards the right uh, is uh, uh, the, those, uh, the couple who have been assassinated uh, uh, towards the end of uh, the Russian uh, the empire. Uh, the uh, Nicholas II and Alexander. Uh, this she has uh, actually uh, put a lot of uh, uh, the investment into Lasputin, uh, the infamous Lasputin. So for Russia, the, the Germany, uh, it was quite helpful. But what about the, the German side? I wouldn't say it is 100% positive. In many respects, uh, Willie uh, Brandt uh, they have uh, become chancellor in 1960, and he has been foreign minister for several years before that. The Ostropolitik, the new Eastern policy, in order uh, to change the European situation, the Ostropolitik uh, has been quite instrumental. So potentially, Germany is, is always given the image that it was always looking towards the East. For example, uh, Henry Kissinger did not like this, and uh, uh, that he uh, was quite critical. What the Chancellor Brandt has done, done is, when the Berlin uh, the wall has been built, he was the mayor of the West Berlin, and uh, he has uh, given given a protest letter uh, to uh, the President Kennedy, but nothing has been done. And at the time, the United States, for West Berlin, uh, was not willing to take uh, the risk of uh, uh, going to war. So nothing uh, was uh, uh, given as a response to avoid the war, especially avoiding the nuclear war, uh, was uh, the top priority at the time. But in reality, for those people living in Berlin, with the walls being built, up until yesterday, you were able uh, to go freely to meet your friends and relatives. But then uh, there were checking points, and uh, railroads have been uh, disrupted, and no of uh, the cars. Even though your brothers and your parents are beyond that wall, you can just uh, um, being able uh, to uh, say uh, hello, but uh, you were not able uh, to actually uh, to meet in a person. So from the human point of view, how to 
I mean, had to, to make the situation uh, the better uh, for the citizens. That was in the mind of uh, uh, the Mayor Brandt to try uh, to improve uh, the life of the citizens so that uh, from time to time you will be able to meet your mother or your father. Uh, for example, during the Christmas time, uh, the, uh, the pass will be provided uh, to the citizens so that you can go beyond the wall. So step by step, uh, uh, the, uh, the policies have been taken. And from SPD's point of view, eventually, back in 1989, uh, the walls that have crumbled. And uh, uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz is uh, connected to this line uh, of uh, the history. And there was Egon Abal. Uh, he has talked about policy of small steps by baby steps. You will bring change. And at the end of the tunnel, you could see unification of the two Germanys and go through or the, the trade and try to bring change. Uh, the bundle of re re handle, a meaning uh, to bring change through trade. So because you are human beings, the same human beings, you should not fight. Uh, and bit by bit, you will try uh, to uh, bring changes. So those were the policies taken by the government. And one of the tools being employed was uh, the gas pipeline. Uh, you can go back to 1969, not the Nord Stream right now, but another gas pipeline on a terrestrial basis. Back up to 1960. Uh, Europe uh, has been not buying at all gas or oil from USSR. Oh, there was almost no trade between Europe and USSR. But then Germany was trying to build economic relationship, and towards the end of 1980s, West Germany was the largest trade partner for the USSR. So that was intentional, uh, trying to have economic relations, economic interdependence to be built, and then you can have a dialogue, and you can have negotiation, and you will be able to have a bit by bit the good relationship, and then at last unification. That was the policy undertaken by the SPD. And this has been taken from a certain paper, a thesis, a German gas import from USSR. From 1970, it was almost zero, as you can see. And for the bar, bars, you see the absolute quantity, and the line shows the percentage of import from USSR and Russia. So in 1980s, it has gone up about 50 percent or so, and then it has come down a little bit, and then in 2015 to 2016, it has shot up. So the volume itself is almost constant, although the percentage may be very. So on volume, it has increased linear in a linear the manner. So that is the economic interdependence between Germany and U.S. Tsar and Russia. In 1980s and 1982, it has come down a little bit, but it uh, uh, goes up again. This is the new Cold War, Afghanistan and Poland, that there has been martial law uh, instituted, so economic sanctions have been imposed. But Germany has continued to buy from USSR. So that is the history which continues to today, the Cold War history in the 1980s in terms of Japan US relationship, Cold War, and the Cold War at the European level are very different, especially from Germany and West Germany. The story seems to be quite different. In the 1980s, Germany and USSR, Germany and the Eastern bloc countries, 
have continued trade and have continued to deepen economic interdependence. Of course, the United States didn't like this and uh, have uh, many times asked Germany to cut off the relationship. But in 1989-1990, at last, the German reunification happened. So this is a story in the minds of many Germans. So you have to think about the Ukrainian war from this prism. This lens looks from uh, the Germany, the Germans, the gas pipeline, there used to be none, but you can see just the major pipelines, but if you uh, try uh, to include uh, the smaller ones, it is just like uh, the blood flow. There are so many pipelines connecting Europe and Russia. Right now, what is to be done uh, is to stop uh, this blood flow. But uh, if you stop uh, the flow, it means that uh, uh, your heart may stop. And uh, almost every day in the newspaper, uh, there are stories that have been uh, given uh, whether you are prepared to accept that, that uh, the next winter will be very, very cold. Are you able to withstand the cold? So for half a century, uh, these pipeline network uh, that have been uh, built, but now the pipelines are to be cut off. It is it's not an easy question. It's something quite visible. For Germany, in words, uh, Germans are commit, committing uh, to the West and have been on paper making commitments and promises that that support will be provided, but there are almost no military equipments being provided. That is because uh, the defense, the budget, uh, the has uh, been uh, rather weak and has not uh, been put into good investments. So it took months to try uh, to have uh, maintenance of the existing arsenals. And uh, bureaucratic work seems to have been too complicated uh, to go through the necessary procedures. Uh, and also the politicians are not uh, trying to push that much, perhaps more of applying brakes that is often being reported. Now, at the time of uh, Chancellor Helmut Kohl, Willy Brandt and Helmut Schmidt, in those administrations, uh, they had to have uh, strengthened uh, their relationship uh, with the East, and uh, at the same time, uh, trying to accept NATO, because Government change has happened. Uh, government has changed to the opposition party. Uh, the West German SPD doesn't like the nuclear weapons, neither does it like the NATO. But for the time being, in terms of stability, NATO has to be ex accepted and uh, the nuclear regime had to be ex accepted. But uh, in the longer term, as, if possible, uh, that uh, the two camp system uh, of uh, uh, the NATO and Warsaw, uh, the pact organization, uh, should uh, be resolved and that uh, no more to be dependent upon any nuclear weapons. That was the long term goal for the SPD. On the other hand, uh, the conservative CDU uh, was highly committed to the West and the Western military uh, collaboration, cooperation needs to be supported by Germany. This has been strongly asserted by the CDU. And now the change in government has happened. I shouldn't uh, go into too much of a detail in the interest of time. And Helmut Kohl returns because of the double-track decision of NATO. This is quite a difficult story, so I cannot go into details. But for USSR, uh, with the uh, the nuclear warhead, uh, the medium-range uh, missiles uh, that have been massively being produced. There has been a discrepancy between the West and the, uh, the, and the USSR. So for uh, the Western camp, INF needs to be deployed. That has been uh, raised as a question by Helmut Schmidt, and the NATO had a lot of debate. And deployment has been decided in 1979. 
Why is it double track decision for the INF to be deployed? But then, are you who will be also engaged in uh, the arms reduction as well, arms reduction negotiation. So the situation is quite similar to what is happening right now between China and Japan. And USSR uh, did not respond uh, to uh, any approach uh, of uh, uh, nuclear disarmament. And there has been a lot of uh, the chaos. Uh, one million uh, people went out onto the street for demonstration in Germany. So the Schmidt administration couldn't survive. And they had to go back to the conservative uh, government. And the uh, change in government government never happens without election in Germany, but this was the very first example of such. So the West and NATO should be placed in the center, and European integration should come first. Those were the policies uh, as uh, uh, harbored by uh, the Conservatives administration, but still, under the water, they have continued to buy gas uh, from the USSR and the West Germany, West Germany economy and uh, uh, a German mock, uh, the USSR have become so dependent and they have lost uh, the strength and communist uh, regime had to uh, collapse. So from CDU's opposition, that is the story of uh, the history of reunification. Also accepted the achievements of uh, the Oslo Committee. Now, after that, uh, Chancellor Kohl enjoyed uh, the longest uh, service, and uh, this was uh, succeeded by Red Green Coalition. Uh, the Schroeder administration, Red Green Coalition. And historically, it's very difficult to, to evaluate the administration, but the low labor market uh, reform was a major achievement of this administration. Um, workers' protection was very strong in Germany, but differently. Um, labor mobility was uh, lacking in uh, the German system, but there was a significant uh, reform, and uh, labor mobility was enhanced. Also, Germany it has become a nation where immigrants uh, could, uh, could make a contribution to the labor market, and uh, uh, phasing out of uh, nuclear power stations was also a major achievement. Uh, SPD and uh, Green were against NATO, against nuclear. And uh, uh, it turned out to be uh, against uh, nuclear power generation, and their identity was uh, seriously deeply uh, inscripted in, in, in green. And they decide on phasing out of nuclear. But uh, what energy sources they are going to use? Uh, again, uh, the structure uh, to depend on the Russian gas was uh, strengthened, and uh, that was uh, that resulted in Nord Stream 1 plan. Uh, this is a direct uh, transportation of uh, gas uh, uh, from Russia to Germany. And this was disliked uh, by countries that sit between, in between uh, Germany and Russia. Ukraine, uh, for example, complained. And uh, since about this time, uh, uh, the Putin administration has become increasingly autocratic, authoritarian, uh, and uh, the, the United States didn't like the, uh, the, this idea. Uh, but the uh, uh, Schroeder administration and America administration have uh, always uh, continued this in 50, 60 percent dependency on Russia. Yes, uh, continued, and uh, it was in November of 2011 that Nord Stream 1 opened, and thanks to this, uh, the, the volume of gas import from Russia increased and the dependency on Russian gas increased. And this shows the root of Nord Stream. Finland, Sweden, uh, the, the pipeline passes, uh, so the coastal nations' approvals had to be obtained. So this was a difficult negotiation. However, German, Germany did not give up despite all the criticisms and hard, the difficult negotiations. And uh, the American administration lasted for 16 long years. 
Uh, Milka, there's a CDU politician, but uh, Adenauer, a call line was different from Milka's uh, diplomacy, so Milka diplomacy was different from the Adenauer call line. Uh, uh, Milka's uh, diplomacy was not America NATO first. Of course, uh, when we look at the Merkel uh, and Trump, uh, Merkel, Merkel did not mind uh, picking a fight uh, with uh, Trump. And that is one of the reasons why Merkel was very popular. But uh, the then Abe administration managed to build a positive relations with the Trump administration. This was a quite historical con contrast to what Japan did. And uh, the Merkel administration uh, saw a rise in the Chinese market, and the German auto automobile industry was increasingly dependent on the Chinese market and Nord Stream. Despite a strong uh, complaint by the United States, uh, uh, Merkel rejected such uh, criticism. According to Merkel, this was an economic issue rather than a security issue. So based on the Western um, German uh, tradition, I believe uh, there was an overlay of uh, Eastern, East Germany sentiment. The former West Germany is uh, pro-Ukraine, anti-Russia. However, uh, former East Germany, uh, there are still uh, pro-Russia camp. From uh, East Germany, there are the people are questioning why this war is going on. As a result of uh, digesting all these different views within Germany, uh, this resulted in American diplomacy. Adenauer diplomacy was not uh, carried forward by Merkel. Uh, Merkel did not uh, follow through the West of Bindung of Adenauer. As I said, uh, Olaf Schultz. Took his position in the context of a long tradition of SDP's diplomacy. At the peak of the Ukraine crisis, uh, back in February 14 and 15, uh, he visited uh, Moscow and uh, Kyiv uh, to mediate the situation. And this, he was uh, loyal to uh, the diplomatic uh, tradition. And uh, he also said, says that uh, there are Russian interests in securities and the Russian interests in security will have to be understood. And this is oftentimes said by SDP politicians. I'm very much uh, at a loss as to what this means. But uh, he tried to find a common ground between Kyiv and uh, Moscow. That's what he tried to do on the 14th and 15th of February at the height of the Ukrainian crisis. But, uh, by turning a blind eye to his mediating effort, uh, the war started, and this is the policy speech uh, towards the uh, end of February. Uh, she, he is a very quiet person, but uh, he was very much uh, passionate uh, during this uh, speech, and he cr heavily criticized uh, Russia because uh, Russia started a war despite his efforts to mediate the situation. And uh, he stresses that uh, he said that he, year after year, German, Germany will spend a uh, uh, defense budget of 2% uh, uh, of GDP. And uh, he committed to uh, nuclear sharing, and he announced uh, uh, the purchase of F-35A uh, from the United States. The German defense budget, uh, the trend I would like to show you, this is the German defense budget as a percentage of GDP. At the height of the Cold War, oh, it was in excess of 
of 4% to close to 5% of the GDP the German defense budget was during those days. But after the end of the Cold War, there has been a decline, and uh, it, was, uh, it has been less than what, uh, 2%. Uh, NATO has a policy to ask uh, the members to, to spend 2% uh, of the GDP, and the local administration has uh, repeatedly said that uh, German will do its best, uh, but uh, it had never reached a 2% point line. But uh, this year, the special contribution, budget contribution of 100 billion euro uh, has been decided, and uh, this year uh, the, the German defense budget will exceed 2% of GDP. Uh, what will happen to the budget uh, next year and beyond? Uh, but the uh, balanced budget request is strong there, and uh, Lindner, uh, the FDP, uh, argues for uh, return to uh, balance the budget. So it is uh, questionable whether uh, the Germany's defense budget will continue to exceed 2%. However, the, there is a, nevertheless a commitment. Almost half uh, will be used by the Air Force, German Air Force. F-35 35 of them will be the biggest item, and the helicopters and drones and uh, next generation Euro Fighter, fighter jets, Euro drone developments uh, will be the items uh, which will be covered by this budget. In comparison to this, uh, Navy and Army will not be able to get a significant portion of the defense budget, but uh, there will be an overall increase in defense budget. Now, talking about F 35. As Professor Vermont uh, mentioned during her uh, speech, uh, uh, sh nuclear sharing, uh, it will take time to explain what this is all about, uh, but uh, this is a historically developed uh, a system within NATO. And please refer to my book, which I, I published uh, last year, uh, which talks about the roots and the development of nuclear sharing. NATO's uh, nuclear deterrence depends on the U.S. Uh, nuclear weapons, uh, just like uh, Japan-U.S. alliance, and the, the American nuclear weapons, ICBM on the, uh, on the, the, uh, the continent, or SNBL on the submarines. In addition to that, uh, France and UK have deterrence, and uh, these are the factors to underpin uh, the deterrence of NATO. In addition to that, we have uh, sh nuclear sharing, and 100 uh, or nuclear bombs uh, there are, uh, they say, in six places in five countries. When it comes to policy consultations, uh, the highest decision-making body of NATO is NAC. When the war is to be started, uh, the use of nuclear weapons, uh, the NAC will have to make the decision. This is the supreme decision-making organization. Sweden, Finland, accession to the NATO, uh, the ultimate decision will be made by the NAC. In addition to NAC, they have uh, NPG. And all the members of NATO, without, uh, with an ex exception of France, are uh, there. And uh, share, nuclear sharing and uh, consultation on nuclear are not necessarily the same. The existing nuclear sharing during peacetime, the nuclear weapons are American nuclear weapons although it says sharing. In the case of Germany, uh, there are places uh, where these American nuclear weapons are held, uh, but the American forces uh, control uh, these uh, nuclear weapons because uh, Germany is a non-nuclear weapon state, therefore it is not allowed for Germany to hold and manage uh, nuclear weapons. And during wartime, once the war starts and uh, the use of uh, nuclear weapons, if, and when that's uh, decided upon by NATO, then, the, uh, then only then the, the U.S. forces will be released to the German Air Force, and the uh, German Air Force uh, will mount uh, the nuclear weapons on its uh, fighter jets to use the nuclear weapons. So B-61, the warheads, uh, these, uh, these are the locations. Uh, they say uh, they are kept, being kept, and uh, they used to use tornado, the fighter jet, but this has become obsolete. Tornado has become obsolete, and uh, 
Uh, they don't know how long this can be used. Uh, therefore, the next generation, B61, 2030 uh, warheads, uh, they say they are in Germany. And uh, fighter jets, uh, the next generation fighter jets, uh, will have to be decided upon. This has been pushed down. Uh, this, the can has been kicked down the road, and the Merkel, Merkel administration hesitated uh, to make the final decision. And that is a sign of uh, Merkel administration's uh, less than strong commitment to NATO. Although Merkel is a conservative, why is it that she didn't decide on this? Uh, the SPD, Green, and FDP, the uh, middle of the road, the leftist administration, uh, they do not necessarily like uh, nuclear weapons, and they would prefer uh, ending uh, nuclear sharing. However, uh, the responsibility of uh, Germany within the alliance, and if the responsibility is not uh, lived up to by Germany, then neighboring countries will feel become uh, concerned. That is why uh, this uh, coalition uh, accepted the nuclear sharing, and F-35 purchase was decided upon uh, immediately after the start of the war in Ukraine. Uh, SDF, uh, Air Self-Defense Forces, do have uh, this, uh, but uh, licensing and upgrade uh, will be necessary for uh, to be able to be mounted. Uh, so this is something that uh, Japan cannot be done. Japan cannot do immediately, and Finland has a plan to purchase many of this, but there is no plan for Finland to share nuclear. So as I said earlier on, nuclear sharing uh, Germany is a non-nuclear weapon state, uh, but uh, Germany can join in the nuclear operation. And, uh, this uh, has an effect of uh, increasing the credibility of, as an ally, and uh, this enhances the credibility of uh, extended uh, nuclear deterrence of the United States, not as a menace uh, to uh, the adversary, but this is a system to enhance the credibility amongst allies, and this is a system uh, to manage the alliance. That's what I say here. And in order to join the uh, nuclear consultations, the nuclear sharing is not a uh, must. Uh, there is a confusion in the discussion in Japan. Uh, it's not that uh, information will come to you as once you have uh, nuclear. Uh, this is uh, uh, not a cause. There is no causal relationship there. Just to make sure, because there is some misperception in Japan. AP4 leader summit was one of the major uh, achievements of the NATO summit, uh, but uh, everybody was uh, recognition, uh, recognized uh, the threat of uh, Russia. That is why Finland and Sweden joined, and uh, its strategic concept uh, was a reflection of that. At the same time, uh, NATO summit uh, talked about uh, China as a systemic challenge. I know that the time is running out, so I should start uh, concluding my remarks. This is just a recap of what I've already discussed. Departure from Russian natural gas. Uh, Chancellor Schultz has been saying this uh, since the spring, but uh, it is unlikely this will be achieved by winter because there is no uh, LNG plant. Poland, even Poland uh, established LNG plant after Crimea. Uh, Merkel administration had a uh, plan, two or so plans on the paper, but uh, there was a Merkel administration has been neglecting this. Uh, therefore, Russia is, is a vulnerable situation against the Russian menace or threat. And uh, that is why there is a possibility for Germany to go back to uh, peace uh, mediation. And uh, he have, they have committed to stopping nuclear power stations. Uh, the opposition parties argue that uh, we should uh, use uh, nuclear power stations when there is a significant shortage of gas. So for the current administration in Germany, technological innovation will be the key, and the climate club uh, 
of work on by G7. And、uh, the key for the current administration will be to nurture climate climate to front row to decarbonization during this process. I guess it could、uh, have played an increasingly important role, but this will be missing. Therefore, they will have to step and recede two steps. But、uh, they will have to leap forward to、uh, the next、uh, technology without going through natural gas. And that is、uh, why the short administration is a very difficult、uh, situation. And the Climate Club will be an important means for Germany to engage the developing countries. So, against the backdrop of the history, German history, this is what I would argue. Given the current situation and the failure of German policies towards the USSR and Russia, some may say that these German policies have been a total failure, but I do not necessarily agree. At the time of、uh, ending Cold War back in 1989 and 1990, this was a tectonic shift and uh, uh, achieving this tectonic shift、uh, in a peaceful manner. Was、uh, made possible because of the relations that had been cultivated、uh, be before 1989 between the East and the West. So the role of Ostpolitik Ost should be given credit. We, we all now know that the one kind of nation Russia is. But、uh, during the 1990s, everybody had a hope that Russia would become a decent、uh, country. But the、uh, Georgia war in 2008 and、uh, since the war in Crimea in 2014, a common person would say that uh, uh, the Russian gas percentage of that、uh, should have been reduced to 30%. If that had been done,、uh, The rich Germany、uh, would have been in a better place.、Uh, depending、uh, energy, 50%, 60% to a single country is not a wise decision, is not a wise、uh, choice,、uh, not only for Germany but for any country. So, in order for the German diplomacy to move on to the next、uh, step,、uh, SPD may not be difficult. Therefore, the black green administration will have to, be,、uh, have to emerge in order to break from the past. I would like to skip some pages and I would like to briefly touch upon the role of Japan. Professor Jeremot talked about、uh, Abe administration and Kishida administration, the difference in style between the two. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Kishida has、uh, served as the foreign minister、uh, during the administration for many years, and、uh, Prime Minister Kishida should have、uh, is now trying to, to real, realize what、uh, he had、uh, contemplated on during his years. As the foreign minister, and、uh, he has to enhance diplomacy and defense, but、uh, he will need to be more act active in climate change initiatives. And、uh, G7 next year will be held in Hiroshima. And how to link、uh, the fact that he will be hosting G7 in Hiroshima、uh, will be a big question. And、uh, enhancing the norm not to use non use of nuclear weapons and、uh, initiatives for nuclear disarmament and nuclear power plants、uh, could be exposed to. A major threat during conflicts, how to address that, and next generation uh, safe uh, nuclear power generation technologies uh, as a way to overcome climate change. These are the things that、uh, he will have to look at. There is no need to, that,、uh, there is no doubt that this will have to be discussed,、uh, but the German current,、uh, current German administration will not be able to address this issue. Therefore, the Chancellor of Japan has a role to play there、uh, to take a leadership in that kind of a debate. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I will be pleased to moderate the Q&A session. In spite of the pandemic, we have an in-person symposium. 
after a few years for the first time. And I would like to thank all the people in the audience for joining us. Now, as one of the members of the planning team, Let me explain the background. Professor Delamont is uh, visiting uh, the professor and she is now joining us in person uh, despite uh, her very difficult uh, uh, regulations and not uh, on a virtual basis. I am very delighted and glad uh, to have her with us. And uh, her study on Japan and study on Japan EU relations and study on security, having such an academic uh, to talk to us on Russia-Ukraine war, how the EU and Japan are responding respectively. That was selected to be the theme of uh, the symposium. And I have asked Professor Iwama, uh, despite uh, a lot of uh, difficulties, have asked Professor Iwama uh, to also join us to try uh, to perhaps rebut from the Japanese perspective. Uh, so since uh, we have uh, Professor Hedelamot from the Japanese side to have a very strong Or the interlocutors to be able to have uh, this uh, discussion. And uh, the foreign and security policy of France vis a vis Russia Ukraine at the war, including what is happening domestically. So, foreign and security policy, what are the characteristics? of uh, the French diplomacy. That was explained from Professor Delamotte and on the other ha hand from Professor Iwama looked from German perspective. Of course, as a Germany uh, always had a very deep relationship with Russia, so perhaps uh, another uh, distinctive uh, uh, outlier in Europe uh, uh, next to France vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Ukrainian situation. The two major powers of Europe, France and Germany, and their characteristic Unique characteristics in diplomacy seem to have uh, been presented with great relevance by the two speakers. And uh, Professor Iwama uh, will also be giving comment from the Japanese perspective. And also Professor Denamoto would be able to give us uh, some of uh, the lessons for Japan to learn uh, from Europe. Those were some of the aspects of her presentation as well. So perhaps we can have more in-depth uh, dialogue in these uh, respects. Professor Delamot uh, is a student of uh, Japan, so I may uh, deviate a little bit from what uh, we are intended to do. Uh, she came uh, to Japan in July, and in a very short notice, Prime Minister Abe has been assassinated. In a very short period of time, this incident has happened, and as a Japanese student, there are a certain an aspect of, uh, of her fate, so that uh, she has arrived in Japan and this some historic incident happened. And the Abe legacy has been co-authored in English language that uh, the Abe period in terms of uh, foreign and security policy of Japan, this was something that happened for Japan which is no longer reversible. So it is irreversible a thing that may have been institutionalized in the Japanese foreign and security policies. Vis-a-vis -vis the Russia-Ukrainian war, oh, she has mentioned several times in her presentation, but what may be the other legacy as she sees it? From February onwards, uh, she must have observed and analyzed how Japan has been responding to the Russo-Ukrainian war. 
and to what extent uh, the impact of Abe legacy has been working. There were already several points that she has made, but if you could amplify on this, and if there are any comments to be made, and that uh, former Prime Minister Abe has exited from the political scene in an abnormal, abnormal situation. So for the incident itself, of course, uh, we cannot uh, really make an, any analysis right now, but the Abe uh, era uh, itself is now over because Prime Minister Abe has disappeared from the scene. So it has come to a complete end. But uh, the impact and influence and the legacy may persist for the Japanese foreign policy and security policy. So even though Prime Minister Abe himself is no longer with us, uh, what may be the impact still to be felt in Japanese policy making? So if you could also mention on these as well. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Now, thinking about the legacy of Prime Minister Abe in terms of defense policy, there is a certain world view and strategic view that Japan should think more strategically in terms of international relationship. And that is the tradition that he has bequeathed to Japan. In 2015, the new security legislations have been created and how when a crisis happens internationally without any special measures law being legislated, Japan will be able to take certain actions. But putting aside the constitutional amendment without amending the constitution, anything necessary could be done through the new security legislations, and that was actually done by him, and this is quite important. So legally speaking, if uh, there is an international crisis, logistical support can be provided by Japan, and what kind of logistical support is also mentioned, and for what purpose has been made clear uh, to the public. And to the Japanese diet, of course, you should need to go through the debate at the diet, uh, but it will be more of a political uh, decision uh, making because the law is already established and uh, the collective uh, uh, the self defense uh, the right is something also important and uh, this has been institutionalized as well when crisis happens in what situation uh, can collective uh, self defense at uh, the right could be invoked uh, uh, the interpretation of the constitution that has been changed so that this is now made possible. So how can uh, the, self, the right to self-defense could be exercised and executed? is also put into the legislation. And freedom of the Japanese people is threatened. And when that happens, then the right to self-defense could be invoked. That is written in the law. But what kind of situation would this apply? That would be a political decision. So, legally speaking, the preparation has been made. So, the pathway has been opened up. So, looked from national defense, uh, it would be continuing other policy uh, up until now. And the new defense guidelines uh, will be soon uh, to, uh, to be uh, published. And what kind of uh, defense equipment uh, would be necessary going forward. Uh, this may not be directly related to uh, the former Prime Minister Abe, but now Prime Minister Abe has decided to increase 
the defense budget. This is something of a legacy, if I may say so. Before oh, 2012, when he was elected to be the prime minister, the Japanese defense budget has been decreasing. But when he was, he became the prime minister. Uh, it has been turned over uh, to be increased. Now, generally speaking, amongst the politicians, uh, Mr. Abe has been able to enhance the interest over uh, the defense budget. This was also true during the Koizumi administration, but in the eight years of Prime Minister Abe's administration, uh, there has been a big change happening on the security arena. For example, National Security Council was established and proactive uh, uh, the diplomacy, uh, the Fouhoto peace that has been promoted, and all those uh, uh, legacy will con be continued by uh, the, the present administration. Well, uh, I'm not a specialist. Uh, in Japan, but uh, in the Middle East, uh, which I specialize in, when Prime Minister Abe visited uh, the Middle East, uh, I mean, he visited uh, Turkey twice a year uh, in a given year, so he pays much importance to Turkey in that year. So the visit by a Japanese Prime Minister for the countries in the Middle East very important. The leader of a country actually paying a visit is very important. Without that, uh, there is not much progress that you can expect in diplomacy in many countries in the Middle East. What uh, puts Japan apart is that not limited to diplomacy, but uh, uh, the bureaucrats are playing a significant role in Japan. And uh, prime ministers, uh, ministers uh, do not necessarily have to visit uh, Japan to make things happen. If Japanese uh, bureaucrats uh, were to, uh, can communicate with the bureaucrats of the other country, um, I think there is a strong belief in Japan that the things can happen. But uh, uh, countries uh, other than Japan do not necessarily agree. People on the ground have always felt that. Embassies on the ground, if the prime minister and ministers uh, could uh, pay a visit, uh, then uh, things could happen. But uh, uh, prime ministers and ministers, Japanese prime ministers and ministers, would uh, visit uh, a country uh, every once and then, perhaps once in a, in, in a 10 year period or once in a 20 year period. However, with the start of the Abe administration, Prime Minister Abe and the ministers of his cabinet uh, started to pay visits to countries around the world. I know that there are pros and cons, but uh, Prime Minister, uh, Foreign Minister Kono, I mean, there are pro pros and cons to the frequency of his uh, foreign visits, but uh, uh, during the Abe administration, he himself paid uh, visits to foreign countries and he uh, advocated diplomacy and uh, he took an initiative in moving diplomacy forward and this was a major change for Japan. Um, for minister, before serving as the Prime Minister, the foreign minister of Japan, a foreign minister of Japan, got appointed uh, from uh, uh, strong leading members of uh, uh, the political faction uh, because uh, these are the leaders of the political faction which, uh, who can make things happen in Japan. So uh, those uh, foreign ministers in the past uh, were those who had power within a political faction in Japan. But uh, for now the foreign minister Japanese Foreign Minister uh, leading uh, diplomacy as the top uh, diplomat of Japan. So there was a major change in, uh, in recognition. Uh, I'm an outsider and I'm a lay person, but that is how I would assess. And uh, Prime Minister Abe would uh, talk to the public uh, through popular broadcasting programs and 
Which is on the uh, legacy. Uh, it's a pricey book, uh, but uh, uh, for those who are interested, if I would uh, strongly recommend this book. And uh, going back, this is a question for uh, Professor uh, Iwama. The first question I have for you is this You talked about uh, post war German history. And uh, he, you said that there was a strong Ost politic uh, tradition in the post war Germany. Uh, so, with the war in Ukraine, there is a disappointment, dissatisfaction by Polish, uh, Arta, and uh, the, uh, the Nordic countries against uh, Germany. But this is deeply rooted in the German history, and uh, it may not be easy for Germany to, to change. Chancellor Schultz, immediately after taking office, the statements he made, were at least a determination by uh, Chancellor Schultz for change. And it's been almost six months since uh, Chancellor Schultz uh, taking office. Uh, historically, uh, it seems that uh, it, will be, it won't be easy for Germany to change overnight. However, uh, Chancellor Schultz uh, showed his determination to change. And these are the two vectors. And which is uh, stronger now in Germany? I mean, when winter comes, uh, uh, Germany could become uh, weaker need. You could be cynical. But at the same time, uh, Russia may have uh, kicked an own, own goal. I don't know whether this could apply to German policy, but... Uh, a change which was unthinkable is now taking place thanks to the Ukrainian policy by Putin. Some say, it, some say that uh, Russia made a, an own goal. Uh, do you think uh, against Germany, do you think uh, Putin has made an own goal? I mean, do you think uh, the irreversible change has already taken place? Well, thank you. Let me first of all talk about the Abe legacy. For Abe administration, uh, Japan Russia peace treaty, uh, the administration was eager to sign. And that is the biggest difference between Germany and Japan. Japan has not seen an end of the World War II. And this obviously has an implication on Japanese diplomacy. And uh, in comparison to Germany, uh, Japan quickly changed. And Japan was quicker to change in comparison to Germany. And this is very interesting. Abe met uh, with Putin face to face uh, a number of times. And uh, he strived to build uh, positive relations with Russia to end uh, the Second World War, post the war era with Russia, uh, although this was not successful. It is a reality that there is such a situation between Japan and Russia, but the Kishida administration, I would say, didn't pay attention, much attention to that uh, tentative uh, deterioration in Japan-Russia relation cannot be avoided. It's not that we have a strong tie, trade ties with Russia. If anything, uh, uh, this, if this were a, a chess situation involving China, uh, Japan would have had a uh, much more difficult situation. But uh, turning our eyes to Germany, I mean, for Germany, a post-war era has already ended. Uh, it ended at the time of uh, East-West uh, unification. Still, uh, I 
Once again, recognize that uh, it's not easy for Germany to sever ties with Russia. Looking at the German, uh, German attitudes uh, for the past, over the past uh, six months, Germany continues to swing. It's like a pendulum. Uh, there are different views within Germany. And uh, public poll shows uh, high popularity of uh, Green Party. Green Party is uh, uh, anti-Russia, anti-China. Uh, uh, so Green Party is uh, popular, however, uh, the popularity is 20%, less than 40%. So uh, there are parties uh, with uh, the approval rating of uh, 20% or so, which means that it shows uh, that uh, Germany itself is divided as to the future of its diplomacy. Green and the CDU, CDS, uh, if they become, if they can come together, uh, this, they could win 40% of approval votes. But uh, there is a realistic matter. I mean, there is a lack of gas, and uh, how are they going to live through cold winter? I mean, how to live through this uh, upcoming cold winter is going to be a major challenge for Germany. And Putin knows that really well. And uh, for Putin, this is a leverage. And uh, since the start of the, even since the start of the war, uh, the supply of gas from Russia has been declining for the past, for, 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 for 12 months preceding in the run-up to the war. Uh, and everybody was skeptical. Why is it that the supply of gas from Russia is declining? Uh, Japanese people may think this was an own goal by Russia. But the world in the eyes of the Russians may be different from the role that we see. That applies to energy, that applies to grain export, uh, the black blockade of the Black Sea are good examples of that. Russia has fought wars repeatedly where they, their position was unfavorable in the initial stages. However, they've uh, made a comeback, significant comeback against Napoleonic uh, war. So the Western world may see uh, what uh, Russia has been doing as an own goal by Russia. However, uh, the Russians may not uh, agree. Now, conversely, what is not visible to us, something is uh, seen from the Russian people's eyes that may not uh, be seen from us. Looking at the opinion polls, uh, the former is Germany division, I don't, I don't not know how to express, but they are much more closer or more understanding of Russia and Russians, it seems. So how should we regard this phenomenon? We think that it is post-Cold War, uh, the former uh, the Central and Eastern Europe, when we visit those countries, dramatically and ra very rapidly, they have been westernized. We have witnessed this to happen. For example, the Czech Republic, right now, Oh, we cannot really readily see that they used to be in the Eastern Bloc. Of course, uh, the city scape uh, may be something more Eastern, but the citizens, the people there, uh, is much more geared towards the Western the style of living and also thinking. But in Germany, uh, the former had East Germany after three decades. So so the mentality and perception and perspective, do you think that they, they persistently continue to have those kind of a thinking? So when the war has happened, would it be stimulated and provoked as an emotion? Would you think so? I'm not a, uh, a sociologist, so I cannot give you an in-depth analysis, but I would like to ask Professor Ikechi, what about the, the people in the Middle East? How are uh, they looking at this war? In my own university, there are many students coming from the devo developing countries, not from the, the West. And the majority of the African nations and in Asia, there are many countries who are more neutral 
vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Ukrainian situation. So looking at the whole world, even though what we think that this is something norm and standard amongst the G7 countries, globally they may not be the norm or standard. Even in Germany, uh, the former Eastern uh, the Germany, or in the, Bal the Balkan the states, they may be uh, different. And what about Middle East? So I would like to ask Professor Ikeuchi. Yes, I would also, I would also like to ask a question about Turkey. When I have been watching the Ukrainian war, Turkey is playing a very important role. And looking at the previous war in Syria and Libya, uh, the Turkish diplomacy has been quite uh, uh, active and has been quite successful, it seems. So if you could also elucidate on this. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Yes, it is very true, be it East Germany or the former Central and Eastern Europe countries. Uh, deep in their hearts and minds, they may not uh, be always agreeing with the G7 type of thinking. And this is much more clear when we look at the Middle East. And Japan is not a Western country, but in the modern times, we have always perhaps deliberately tried to belong to the Western camp and from objective point of view and look from the outside. I wouldn't say that the culture is the same, but uh, Japan has always thought to be in the Western camp, and the people have not uh, questioned this. And this is something unusual, if I may say so, especially looking at the countries of Middle East and also even amongst the countries of Asia. The Western bloc, that Japan belongs to the Western bloc, when there has been very clear cut uh, the Western and Eastern camp, uh, politically, uh, this could have been the something relevant, but even after the Cold War has ended, that the Japan uh, continues to be within the Western camp, and that is quite unusual. Many countries would not uh, clearly say that this is the case. When I tried to explain to the people in the, the Middle East, deliberately Japan is reaffirming itself that it belongs to the, the Western camp. That is how I explain to those people. And it looks as such, and look from the Middle Eastern point of view to the West or to the Western a camp, they are not really that clearly belonging to that. And even though they would like her to join, they are different, so they cannot really join, and they are not rejoining, uh, actually. And what about uh, the Russian a camp? To try her to be partner with the Russian camp, that cannot work either. A pro-American position will be maintained, but still a try to take a more neutral position and stance. That is what the many countries are trying to do, and as identity for themselves, they are not that really that much of a, have a sense of belonging to the American nor the Russian camps. And the Russian side cannot really offer that, that much, but for all producing in the country where they can offer energy. So there could be a provision of uh, uh, the other uh, profits and the interests that could be aligned with the United States. And there are a lot of things that they could offer. Now, what about Turkey? When we think about multipolar world, that it is Russian, way of denying uh, the control of monopoly of the United States. Uh, the Russian propaganda in trying uh, to 
単極世界が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が弱まって、多数の極端な国が